We are here to study from the book of Acts tonight, so I hope you can be joining me in Acts. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 24. I believe we'll make it all the way through this chapter tonight, so I hope you can join me there. Be turning to Acts chapter 24, and we'll be there in just a moment. But I hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday, if at all possible, at 9 or 11 with the Bible class in between at 10. So we're still studying the exploits of King David. I'm looking forward to that. Hope you can join us there at 10 and then also at either 9 or 11 if you can. Uh, sign up using the Sign Up Genius account so we know how many are coming to each service so we can try to spread that out a little bit better. So hope to see you this coming Sunday. And if you're visiting with us, if you don't have an account through Sign Up Genius that's uh, linked to there through the church website, uh, feel free to just show up. We want to see you on Sunday if at all possible. Uh, tonight, again, we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts. So the book of gospel action, the uh, some of the acts of some of the apostles, as we've described it over the past several months together. It's written by Luke, the beloved physician, and it's written to a man by the name of Theophilus, just giving Theophilus a history of the early church. We're using the ABCs as something of a memory tool where we're assigning a successive letter of the alphabet to each chapter in Acts. And so this helps us to remember what's there. So, so far we've looked at the ascension, the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons always with a question mark, great hero, how can I, I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionaries sent out, not gods but men, old law not binding, Philippian jailer converted, questions answered in Athens, Reasoning with the preacher, saving our religious friends, Troas on the Lord's Day, uproar in Jerusalem, valuable citizenship. And last week we finished up the second half of Acts 23, waiting to kill Paul. By way of very brief review, Paul has been falsely accused and nearly killed in the uh, temple by a Jewish mob. He's rescued by the Romans. He makes his defense before the Jewish ruling council. A group of men plot to kill Paul. But thankfully, due to Paul's young nephew speaking up, the Romans rescue Paul once again, uh, whisking him away by night to Caesarea with more than 470 Roman soldiers. And that is where we pick up tonight. So Paul is ready to face the Roman governor Felix. And in the ABCs of Acts, we are looking at the excuses of Felix. The excuses of Felix. I'm so sorry about that. But if you can do any better with the letter X for chapter 24, I would love to hear from you. And I would be glad to update that. But I'm pretty impressed, I think. Even as, as bad as it is, I think that's about as good as we can do with the X. So excuses of Felix. But get in touch if you've learned of something else or if you think of something else with the letter X in it for our study this week. Last week, we looked at this picture of the Roman facility in Caesarea, and we actually have the actual floor of the actual palace where Paul is most likely uh, staying on this occasion where he's making his defense here. And so this is it. And historians are uh, very, very highly confident that this is the actual place where Paul was confined and where he made his defense. So they've done a lot of excavations in this area. The, the location is correct. And the architecture is correct and, and that. So this is the building or the remains of the building. Obviously, there would have been a ceiling and walls and that kind of thing. But this is the floor of that palace or that Roman facility. So I'm sharing this again tonight because uh, what we're about to read uh, almost certainly happened in this place, in this picture. So um, obviously, it would have looked a lot different from this. But this is the floor of that building. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 24. And the first paragraph is verses 1 through 9. Acts 24, verses 1 through 9. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, with an attorney named Tertullus, and they brought charges to the governor against Paul. After Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying to the governor, Since we have through you attained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation— we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. But that I may not weary you any further, I beg you to grant us by your kindness a brief hearing. For we have found this man a real pest, and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And he even tried to desecrate the temple... And then we arrested him, 
We wanted to judge him according to our own law, but Lysias, the commander, came along and with much violence took him out of our hands, ordering his accusers to come before you. By examining him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the attack, asserting that these things were so. Well, Paul then stays in custody for five days before his accusers show up. Remember, uh, Paul's young nephew had uncovered the plot that the 40 men had made with the high priest that the, uh, they were planning on calling the commander to bring Paul in so they could examine him more thoroughly, and they were planning on ambushing him between the barracks and the council chambers. So Paul's nephew hears about this, he becomes aware of this plot, and he warns the commander. So he very courageously speaks up. Uh, the commander then used overwhelming force to transfer Paul up to Caesarea. So this takes place five days later. And uh, so it takes five days for the Jewish leadership to figure this out, kind of to get their act together, to send this delegation over to Caesarea. So their goal is to bring charges against Paul to this governor. Uh, by way of review, the governor here is Felix. We'll find in a little bit here that Felix is married to Drusilla. Drusilla is one of the three daughters of King Herod Agrippa I. He's the guy who murdered James back in Acts 12. I believe he's also the guy who accepted the praise as if he were a god and was eaten by worms and died. So this is her family, and uh, he's this is her dad. So he, she is one of the three daughters of this man. Drusilla's great uncle was Herod Antipas, the guy who murdered John the Baptist in Mark chapter 6. Her great-grandfather, Herod the Great, was the guy who murdered all the baby boys in Jerusalem in an effort to kill Jesus. Uh, Josephus, the Roman historian, tells us that Drusilla married Felix at an early age. Uh, Felix saw her beauty, used a magician to cause her to leave her husband and to live with him instead. And so I'm just saying this is the kind of couple that we're dealing with in this chapter. Felix is not a good person. Well, in this delegation, here to bring the charges against Paul in front of Governor Felix, we have Ananias, the high priest, we have some Jewish elders, so I'm assuming members of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin, and then we have their attorney, a man by the name of Tertullus. Uh, starting in verse 2, everybody comes together. We start hearing from Tertullus, the attorney brought in by the Sanhedrin. So this is something like a, a courtroom setting. It's taking place on the floor of this uh, that palace or that facility, that the, the picture we looked at a few minutes ago. We have Felix probably on something of a throne, a, a seat, at the front of the room, and then we have this prosecution team over to one side, and then we have the Apostle Paul perhaps standing there by himself. And in verse 2, Tertullus gets up to speak, and um, do we see just a, a bit of flattery here? Uh, absolutely. This guy is over and above here, beyond. And so remember, the Jewish people absolutely hate the Romans. They hate the Roman occupation. They hate everything about it. But this guy, again, he's over the top in love with Felix. Uh, through you, we have obtained much peace. <laughs> they didn't want them there in the first place, but you are the great peace bringer, Governor Felix. And so you've provided reforms and you do all these wonderful changes for us. Everybody knows this. Uh, everybody knows how awesome you are in every way, in every place, in everywhere. And he addresses him as most excellent Felix at the end of verse 4. Um, Tertullus expresses his thankfulness. Just a note here on the most excellent Felix. This is where we believe that Luke was writing to uh, Theophilus and addresses Luke, I believe it was, to uh, most excellent Theophilus. So there's that connection. Maybe that was some kind of common uh, title that was given to government types. But anyway, at the end of verse 4, we get back to that. Tertullus expresses his uh, thankfulness. And he goes on to appeal to Felix's kindness, doesn't he? Um, I mean, there's no way the Jewish leaders actually believe these things about Felix. They know he's a terrible person. They know he's terribly immoral. He's got an awful reputation. He's representing Rome's oppression over them. But this attorney starts with some over-the-top praise for this man. Uh, after the slimy introductory comments, Tertullus announces the charges. If I could break these down into bullet points, I, I think these are kind of the issues that they have with Paul. Number one, this guy is a pest. I don't know if that's really a, a legal term. I don't know if that's really against the law to be a pest, but that's their number one complaint. This guy is a pest. So kind of similar to the accusation back in Thessalonica in Acts 17.6. These men who have upset the world have come here also 
So Paul is a pest, and I think the, the Greek word behind that is it's, it's the idea of a plague, um, a pestilence, some kind of terrible thing sweeping the world, a virus we might say. Paul is a pest, so that's number one. Number two, Paul is stirring up dissension among the Jews throughout the world, and so he's a pest, and he's also divisive, so he's causing uh, people to break apart. He's creating division in the religious world. Uh, number three, Paul is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. We'll get back to that in just a little bit, but he's a leader of a sect, a division. And then number four, Paul tried to desecrate the temple. So this is it. He's a pest, he's divisive, he's a ringleader of a sect, a Jewish sect, a religious thing, and then he's tried to desecrate the temple. We'll get back to Paul's response in just a moment. Uh, I would just point out a, a kind of a shift here in the accusation. Remember, in previous chapters, they were actually accusing Paul of having actually desecrated the temple, right? That was what they were getting people upset with, with the mob a couple chapters ago, but here he tried. So a slight shift before he actually did it. Now he attempted to do it. So it seems that when things get serious and they're representing this before an actual Roman governor, uh, they're backing off on that charge that they had at the beginning because they know that's absolutely not true and there's no way they could prove that. So we'll get to his response in just a moment. For now, the attorney, Tertullus, uh, gives his side of what happened, what led them to where they are standing before Felix. He says uh, that they arrested Paul. Is that true? Did the Jewish people kind of send officers to arrest Paul? Not exactly. That, that's not exactly how that went down. I don't remember an arrest as much as I remember an angry mob ready to tear Paul apart limb from limb. Uh, we've got this bracketed comment at the end of verse 6. Uh, we wanted to judge him according to our own law. And again, that's not really what happened. They weren't interested in judging anybody. This was not a trial that they were orchestrating back then. What happened then was certain Jews came in and stirred up the crowds, uh, spreading this rumor about Paul bringing Gentiles into the temple, which he never did. So this was a lot closer to a lynching than it was an actual trial. In verse 7, Tertullus tries to say that Lysias interrupted their orderly trial. <laughs> and came in with much violence, taking Paul out of their hands. Uh, absolutely ridiculous for him to be able to say this. So yeah, Lysias did take Paul away, didn't he? But remember, he did it to save Paul from the mob. Uh, so Tertullus then, he's blaming Lysias, this Roman commander for the disorder in the temple, which is not the case at all. Lysias is the one who brought order to disorder. So what what Tertullus gets right is that Lysias has ordered Paul's accusers to come before Felix. In verse 8, Tertullus invites Felix to figure this out, to take their side of this story. Like, I think you'll see this the way we do once you know the facts kind of thing. And in verse 9, Luke lets us know that the Jews basically put their stamp of approval on this, which is interesting. So we have Tertullus and we have the Jews. And it almost makes me think that these men hired Tertullus, maybe as an outsider, maybe kind of a go-between, somebody with a Greek background, kind of to argue their case, maybe an expert in Roman law. He's not really one of them, but he's kind of one of them, kind of like an attorney might represent us today. He's kind of my side, but he's not actually me, not a part of my family. Oh, might have been a language or maybe a cultural barrier going on here, but I'm thinking it also might have been somewhat uh, something about not corrupting themselves. That's a possibility here not having any kind of direct contact with such an evil man as Felix. So we're not told why they have this go-between, but we do have Luke's note about the Jewish leaders uh, being completely behind the argument that uh, Tur Turtles is making here. So he's just kind of saying, we agree with what this guy has said. He is representing us properly. That is our argument. So let's continue tonight with Acts 24, 10 through 21. The next paragraph here, Acts 24, 10 through 21. When the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Since you can take note of the fact that no more than twelve days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship, neither in the temple nor in the synagogues nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. 
In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience both before God and before men. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings, in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia, who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation, if they should have anything against me, or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council, other than for this one statement which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. Starting in verse 10, then, we have Paul's response. Uh, Paul doesn't have an attorney, does he? He's doing this on his own. He's representing himself here. Uh, just remember, I know today we may say that is that is not wise. Uh, he is a fool who has himself as a client. I think that's the old saying about representing yourself as a lawyer. But remember, Jesus had told the other apostles a number of years earlier in Matthew 10, 16 through 20, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So I guess I would say to that, who needs an attorney when God has promised to speak through you? And that's what is happening here. The governor nods, so Paul gets started. I hope we notice the difference between Paul's introduction and the introductory comments made by Tertullus. Tertullus was above and beyond with the flattery. Felix, you are the best thing that's ever happened to us, and, and on and on and on, just paraphrasing there. But Paul, though, starts out by noting that Felix has been a judge for many years. Very interesting, isn't it? Yep, you've been a judge for many years. Uh, my grandmother, maybe your grandmother as well, used to say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And I think looking over this paragraph, that's basically what's going on here. So instead of a compliment, uh, Paul basically says, yep, you have done this for a long time. <laughs> no flattery whatsoever. I mean, that is not a compliment at all, is it? it? It's simply a statement of fact. You've been a judge for a long time, Felix. And to me, that that's pretty much the, the closest thing that Paul can just barely squeeze out. I mean, that's about as close as it gets to a, a compliment here with a, with a clean conscience. You've been a judge for a long time. Uh, Paul does, though, refer to making his defense cheerfully. And this is absolutely in keeping with what we know about Paul. No matter what he goes through, he's able to be uh, content. There is this inner sense of joy and peace. This is not something he's overly concerned about. Uh, he does appreciate the opportunity to defend himself. I mean, the, the alternative is getting torn limb from limb in Jerusalem, so I think he's very thankful for that. Uh, one thing he does have going for him here is that uh, it's only been about 12 days since the supposed offense. So this should be pretty straightforward. This is very recent past. Um, another kind of thing we should kind of note here is that it hasn't been long. In other words, I haven't had time to throw the city into an uproar. It's just been a few days, and half of that I've been sitting here. So I don't really know what I'm accused of doing and how I could have done all that. Uh, but, but notice right here at the beginning how innocent this seems. So he didn't go to Jerusalem for the purpose of wreaking havoc. That's not what he went there to do. But he simply went for the purpose of worship. And he was bringing alms. So in that sense, he was bringing a gift to God. He was bringing a gift to the people on God's behalf. And really, that's the same reason most people go to Jerusalem to, today. I mean, even today, back then and today, just to worship. So it's not there to, to cause trouble. In verse 12, he gets right into it. Nobody saw me doing anything. Nobody saw me doing anything that they accused me of doing, neither in the temple nor in the synagogues nor anywhere in the city. Did they find me doing anything remotely divisive? And I certainly didn't cause a riot. And this is amazing to me. On his travels... Paul often did do some things that might have been seen as riot-worthy. But when he comes back to Jerusalem, Paul is rather low profile. He was there to make this quick trip to the temple. He was there not to speak. No speaking engagements, no gospel meetings going on as far as we know, no arguments. His mission was to just go to the Gentiles. That's his deal now. And there weren't really too many Gentiles in Jerusalem. So he was just making this quick trip to check in with some people. 
So these people can prove nothing. Nobody saw me do anything that they're accusing me of doing. That's a pretty good defense. I didn't do it, and they can't prove it. So that, that very simple, straightforward, right to the point. Starting in verse 14, Paul gets away from defending himself. There's nothing really to defend, and he turns this into an opportunity. Uh, he didn't do anything wrong, but what he did do was serve the God of our fathers. Uh, he's followed the way, which they call a sect. So Christianity, uh, Christianity was seen to be a sect. They, they called it a sect of the Jews, but he says it is seen to be that way. It is claimed to be that. Um, but it's really quite a bit more than that. And obviously we understand that today, just as Paul did then. Uh, in reality, Paul has been serving God, uh, believing everything that's been written in the prophets. So he's saying, I'm just like they are. I, I believe God. I believe the prophets. I believe Moses. I believe all that. He's put his hope in God. I'm just like they are. I am what they claim to be, putting my hope in the resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And remember, this is how he threw his trial in Jerusalem into chaos. He didn't cause the riot. He was saved from the riot. But when he was put on trial for something he didn't do, when he saw he couldn't get a fair trial, he turned the two factions against each other by appealing to the resurrection. And he throws that in here again. So the resurrection changes everything. And again, in verse 16, we have Paul's reminder that he's always done his best to live both before God and men with a blameless conscience. He's always tried to do what he thought was right. He wasn't right for a time when he persecuted the church, but he never violated his own conscience. So he has that going for him here. Uh, starting in verse 17, it seems Paul throws in just a tiny bit of maybe uh, positive self-promotion here. Not, not in a bad way at all, not bragging, but just letting Felix know that he's not at all as bad as these people are making him out to be. Um, so not only did I not cause a riot, but I'm here in Jerusalem to deliver you people a pile of cash. Uh, Paul was in Jerusalem to bring alms to his nation. This would have been Felix's nation, by the way. So Paul is bringing outside funds to Israel. I took money from Greece and I brought it here. It's hard to argue with that. So he's bringing in famine relief. This is a good thing. So he's saying this in his defense, saying something that he's doing that's positive. Not only did I not do that, but this is what I did do. As to the temple incident, Paul was only there to be purified. We studied the whole vow thing a few weeks ago, most likely some kind of ritual purification, kind of bending over backwards to be good in their sight, to give him more opportunities. Uh, and he specifically points out he did this without any crowd, no uproar, no publicity. He just quick in and out, got it done. He was in stealth mode. He was not there to preach and teach and all that. He was just there for his own personal reasons. The real trouble here was the Jews who came down from Asia. And I love how Paul points out in verse 19, these Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should have anything against me. It kind of reminds me of the right that we have in this country to face our accusers, doesn't it? The people who supposedly saw what I did aren't even here today. So, hmm, I wonder why that is. And so this team and their fancy lawyer, they come all the way here to accuse me, but they leave the actual accusers behind. Well, that is kind of curious, isn't it? So I think Paul is hoping Felix sees what's going on here. There's a good chance the accusers chickened out when it came to facing an actual judge, indicating that the charges were probably made up in the first place. I think most people could see through that. And we also see it in the shifting of the charges from actually bringing Gentiles into the temple to attempting to bring Gentiles into the temple, which is a lot harder to prove. Uh, Paul also gives the high priest and his attorney an invitation to state what he's actually done that's wrong. In what way have I violated the law? That's a very simple question. And it's a question that they cannot answer. And uh, Paul knows why he's really in trouble. He's on trial for that reference to the resurrection. And making a statement about the resurrection is obviously not against the law at all. But what Paul says here is the truth that he really shouldn't be on trial at all. This is a waste of everybody's time. So let's continue tonight with Acts 24, 22 through 27. Acts 24, 22 through 27. But Felix, having a more excellent or more exact knowledge about the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom, and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. 
But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. In verse 22, we find that Felix knows something about the way. Felix knows something of what's really going on here, and he knows he's not getting the whole story. And we do have several possibilities as to how Felix knows so much about the Lord and his church. Remember who else is from Caesarea? Cornelius the Centurion is from Caesarea, baptized by Peter back in Acts chapter 10. You think Cornelius and Felix might have had some interactions? I believe that is entirely possible. We have Philip the Evangelist, one of the original seven servants. He's also in Caesarea. He's been in Caesarea for at least 20 years now. And then I think we also had Agabus the Prophet in Caesarea. So those are three good choices, three good options for how this guy finds out about the church. Um, and there must have been other Christians in the area, but at least these are three. So when Felix is described as having a more exact knowledge about the way, we do have several possibilities there. He seems to have heard the gospel message. He knows something about the Lord and the church, his kingdom. So Felix is hearing these accusations. He knows that there's more to this story. I'm not getting the whole truth from, from this situation here. Something's off. And instead of just dismissing the case, though, and instead of finding Paul guilty, he kind of he's not going one way or the other. He just delays. He just puts it off. And his reason is, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, then I'll decide your case. So Felix then says he wants to hear more from the commander. And remember, the Jews have accused this commander of violently ripping Paul away from them in the middle of this peaceful trial. And that just doesn't sound right. So let's wait for Lysias. But what's amazing to me is they wait two years. How long do you think it would take the governor to really get a commander up here to answer for something? I mean, we've already learned this. It's like 68 miles. You could do that in a couple days. So he's in no hurry. He is completely delaying through this thing. So in response, Paul is confined, but he is given some freedom. His uh, friends are allowed to minister to him. I remember having a good friend, one of my college roommates, doing some mission work over in Romania, and they were allowed to minister to their friends and loved ones who were in a hospital. They didn't have hospitals staffed like we have today. They had doctors, but nobody was there to take care of the patients when they weren't being seen by the doctors. And so if you wanted your linens changed in the hospital, you'd better have a friend on the outside who could do it for you. And that's kind of the way I see this here. It kind of reduces expenses for the government you're confined here, but we'll let your friends come and interact with you. So if you need whatever, it's up to them to bring it. So that seems to be what's going on. Uh, after a while, Felix comes back with his wife, Drusilla. He sends for Paul. They hear Paul speak about faith in Christ. So it's not a trial, but Felix is kind of curious. He wants to know more about the Christian faith, and Paul is obviously happy to have that opportunity. However, as Paul talks about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, starts to get serious, doesn't it? And Felix gets scared. And I think we understand why. These topics are getting pretty personal. Obviously, Paul could have restricted could have restricted his teaching to Jewish history or practical life lessons from Moses or, I don't know, how to have a happy family or, or whatever. But what I'm amazed is uh, by here is Paul customized this lesson based on what Felix actually needed to hear. And Felix needed to hear from God concerning righteousness, self-control, and the fact that there is a judgment to come. Concerning righteousness, Felix was not righteous at all. <laughs> he was not righteous. He was known for taking bribes and all that, just a terrible human being. Concerning self-control, Felix had none. None of that. So he had convinced Drusilla to leave her husband to come marry him. So if he wanted it, he got it. He was the governor. He did what he wanted. So self-control. And concerning the judgment to come, here we have Felix, a judge himself, needed to understand that even he was accountable to a higher power. And Paul was willing to deliver this message. It wasn't what Felix wanted to hear, but it was exactly what Felix needed to hear. And in response, Felix became frightened. He's terrified. But instead of rejecting it outright, instead of just having him executed or sent back or, or released, instead of accepting it, Felix delays. So the excuses of Felix... 
And his response here is, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. In other words, I just don't have time to deal with this right now. The excuses of Felix. Go away, I'll call for you. Don't don't call me, I'll call you. Um, part of that delay was also the hope that Paul might pay him off. And again, Felix is hoping for a bribe. What, a, what an awful government official. So he's leaving an innocent man in prison for two years plus. He's hoping for a bribe. But every once in a while, he would call for Paul to have some conversations. So as I see this, to Felix, Paul was almost like some kind of a, a circus act, a, a curiosity, someone entertaining to listen to. So like we might watch a horror movie. Whenever Felix wanted to be scared, he'd call for Paul, and Paul would start preaching about judgment and that kind of stuff. Ooh, that's terrible. Okay, okay, go. I can't take any more of that. So on and off, on and off. In verse 27, after a couple years, Felix gets called back to Rome by Nero. We know this is about 60 AD, I believe, from uh, secular history. Uh, new guy Festus comes in and takes his place. But like a, like a slimy politician on his way out the door, Felix leaves Paul in prison just to keep the Jews happy. So no sense of right and wrong. No sense of justice. It's This is politically expedient. I'm just going to leave Paul in prison. Uh, some believe that Luke and Paul worked together on the book of Acts during this two-year period. And so that's interesting. Some good did come from this. We assume Luke had access there just along with the others. Uh, but this is where we leave it tonight. Paul is in prison for two years. The, the governorship of the area rolls from one to another, from Felix to Festus. And we'll learn more about Festus next week, if the Lord wills. Uh, tonight, though, we've looked at Acts 24. And I think we understand now the heading in the ABCs of Acts, the excuses of Felix. Again, let me know if you think of something better than that, something using the letter X. I'll be glad to pass it along and make the update here. But uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you can all be together Sunday. I'm looking forward to seeing you. So Sunday at 9 or 11 with Bible class in between. Make sure to sign up on the Sign Up Genius if you can. And I'm uh, looking forward to seeing you Sunday. Let me know if there's something we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only, one and only holy God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Paul, and the God of Luke. Thank you for the book of Acts, and thank you for the life and service of your servant Paul. We're thankful for his courage and for his example. Tonight we ask you to bless our government officials. We pray that they will lift up those who are good and punish those who are evil. We pray for your church here in Madison. Bless us as we love each other, and bless us as we love the people that you have placed around us. Help us to influence this world for good. In Jesus we pray. Amen.